See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled by him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they have not been told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before us like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to Him, and nothing in His appearance that we should desire Him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, He was despised, and we held Him in low esteem. But surely, He took our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered Him stricken, punished by God, stricken by Him, and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on Him, and by His wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his descendants and his life and his life will prosper. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide his spoils with the strong, because his life was poured out unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and has made intercession for the transgressors. 700 to 750 years before the death of Jesus, the prophet Isaiah spoke and then penned these words. Did he have any clue what he was talking about? Like, did he know in his mind that there would be a Messiah who was of God, who was, who was God himself, who would come down in the flesh and be scourged and whipped, nailed, ridiculed, spat on? Did he know that there would be a lamb? Did he know that he would suffer? Did he know that the God of the universe would become a person and would end up in a grave only three days later to rise again? Did he know? I don't know. I don't know how much Isaiah knew when he penned these words. But there is something that I know. I know that we know. This passage has, for the last 2,000 years, been one of the cornerstone passages through which we understand exactly what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Like, if you have been in church for two weeks and know about Jesus and the cross, and you read these words, and you hear these words spoken aloud, you can't help but stop and say, yeah, that's Jesus. Like the one who is spoken about in Isaiah, the end of Isaiah 52 and into Isaiah 53, is the Son of God, is the Messiah, Jesus. Today we're in Acts chapter 8. Go ahead, go ahead and grab your Bibles, turn there. Um, or as you're 
kind of scrolling on your phone to that passage or your tablet or it's also going to be on the screen. I want to set, set you up with where we're at. Um, but first, let me, let me get a story in. Now, a few of you know, I've got a big dog. Her name's Jinx. Um, she's a sweetheart and she wouldn't hurt a fly. But all 100 pounds of her would hurt a rabbit. And one day, it was about midnight, um, because I, uh, I have, um, I'm irresponsible and I don't go to bed on time. It was about midnight. I was uh, taking her out before bed. And um, she was kind of finding her spot, settling in. And then she perks up, looks, and catches a rabbit. And I had just been happening to, like, have been switching her leash, which is one of those retractable, extended leashes that has this plastic casing. In between my hands, I was exchanging it. And she caught me at just the right moment and jerked the leash out of my hands and just taken off after the rabbit. The leash, as soon as it hits the ground, the plastic part must have scared her because she jumped and, and took off even faster. And so there you have my 100-pound dog and me uh, running around in circles in this parking lot of my apartment complex. And I'm like, no, I'm going to get this dog. Like, I'm making it my mission to catch this dog. And then she runs in between the buildings uh, and runs behind the building of the one next to mine, and I lose sight of her. And I'm like, oh, no, what am I going to do? So I pull out my phone. It's all I got on me. And I pull out the flashlight on my phone. If you've ever used the flashlight on your phone, you know. It's not, like, you can't call it a flashlight. It's horrible. And, and so I'm running through the dark at midnight, um, like in, in between this apartment building and these trees, looking for my dog. And I kid you not, this is the weirdest thing, one of the weirdest things that has ever happened to me. I'm running and I get to the last apartment in the building next to mine, and this old guy walks out and he rasps, yes, rasps, not talks, rasps, like a Scooby-Doo villain. He's like, he went that way. And I'm like, what, what is my life? Like, how did I get here? And so I thank him, and I'm not kidding. He goes like, and like shoes me away like he doesn't want anything to do with me. I don't know if he, she bothered him or something, but he pointed out to the forest. And so I run into the trees. If you know me, I'm not like a huge nature guy, and I'm definitely not a huge nature guy at midnight. And so I'm, I run like 30 yards into the forest, and there I find my dog like wrapped up in the thicket where her leash is caught up in a bunch of bushes. And so I unrash, unwrap the leash and I unclip it and put it in my pocket and I pick up all 100 pounds of her and run her like 50 yards back to my apartment. Like I wasn't going to lose my dog. I wasn't going to just let my dog run away. I heard a preacher one time describe what it means to follow God as, like, as a kite. And he's like, if we follow God and we are grounded, like we are holding, we, he is held, we are grounded and he is holding the kite string of what we are in his hands, then we will fly high. But if you are not grounded and you seek this freedom and you seek to run away, then he will let you go. But kites won't fly if nobody's holding on. The wind will pick them up for a while and then it'll let it crash. And we, like, like dogs that are off their leash, we like kites that have been let go, we have fallen away. And we've crashed and burned. And so, we come to this passage and realize that God gives His people a mission to go after people who are off the leash. That God gives His people a mission to go after kites that have fallen on the ground. To tie them back onto the hands of our Lord so that we can soar like we were meant to. He gives this mission to, Steve, to Philip. excuse me. Now Philip, uh, if we're setting the story, is given a mission. And he is a deacon, along with Stephen and five others. Now, um, you see this in Acts 6. I don't know if we covered it in here, but in Acts 6, uh, the deaconship is established. And we see first that uh, Stephen is, is killed for his faith. But now we enter into the story of Philip. And Philip gets it in his heart that he wants to go and win people for Christ in Samaria. And so it's recorded in Acts 8, 4 through 8 that he goes to Samaria and he preaches there for a while. And apparently it's successful because in Acts 8, 14, we see that the apostles in Jerusalem are hearing about how the Samaritans are accepting the gospel. Here's the thing. God doesn't want Philip to stay in Samaria. And that's where we pick up. So starting in verse 26, it says this. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandaki, which means queen of the Ethiopians. 
This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay with it. I believe that um, this passage reveals three things that we are supposed to take into account when it comes to the gospel. So the first thing is, is three C's. It's easy. The first is this. You are chosen to share the gospel. You are chosen to share the gospel. This first part of the, 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 the story sets up the story. If you're familiar with stories, movies, books, whatever you like to read, you have to set up the story and set up the characters. And so the first one is the one in this story who was chosen to share the gospel. It's Philip. And Philip, like I mentioned, is a deacon of the church. Now, that's important because I want you guys to understand, Philip is not like a missionary, although he does missions. He's not a minister. He's not a pastor. He's not an elder. He's not biblically and theologically trained. He's a normal guy who has a responsibility within the church, like many of the men in this room who are deacons, but who are not trained classically in theology and trained classically in biblical interpretation. He's just like, I got to share and so he goes to Samaria, and he preaches the gospel successfully. He's just a normal dude who's obedient to God. He's the second character in the story, though, and it's the Ethiopian eunuch. He's in charge of the treasury of the queen of Ethiopia. Now, this isn't where modern Ethiopia is. This is probably where modern Sudan is. And what they were was a place that was famous for um, exporting, like mining and exporting gold. It was a wealthy kingdom. And this guy would have got a portion of the treasury as the treasurer. That was how he was paid. And so he was a very wealthy man. He wanted for nothing. Except as we read and as we see, he wanted an, a spiritual experience with God. He had taken this pilgrimage all the way across Africa and into uh, the Middle East and into Israel because he wanted to go to the temple to worship. But as we'll see, like as we understand Judaism, he couldn't go really into the temple. He had to stay in the court of the Gentiles, even though he was very interested in becoming a Jew. He's what we call a proselyte. And he, and he wanted to become a part of this religion, but he couldn't because he was a eunuch and therefore could not be circumcised and therefore could not be welcomed in. But he searched out God. He wanted God. And yet because of the religion, because of the rules and standards, he was kept at bay and couldn't be welcomed in. It was probably heartbreaking for him. And so we have Philip and we have the eunuch, but there is a third character in the story. Did you catch it? It's the Holy Spirit. And don't miss this character. Many people who call this book that we're reading today the Acts of the Apostles. I don't think it's that. I think it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. I think we see the Holy Spirit working in God's church and working in the world to see the kingdom of God expanded beyond cultural boundaries and beyond the boundaries of differences that people make and put up for themselves. You see, the Spirit is the third character of the story. And we'll see that the Holy Spirit throughout the book of Acts is working to see the gospel taken to the ends of the earth. So we have the characters, but the other thing that we need for a good story is this. We need a lesson. We need a moral of the story. And we'll see that unpacked as we go, but here is the moral of the story. That the gospel is for everyone, everywhere, every time. You see, there's, there's a theme in the book of Acts that I want you to see. I don't know if you've caught on already, but, but we are seeing the fulfillment of Jesus' mission to the apostles in Acts chapter 1. We see it in Acts 1, verse 8. It says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And if you spend five minutes looking at a map of first century Israel, you will see that these are rapidly expanding concentric circles. In other words, you have Jerusalem, the city, which sits in Judea, and, and Samaria is the next country over, and then to the ends of the earth. Jesus wants to see his kingdom cross cultural divides, cross the divides that keep us separated as humanity and, and keep us separated because of sin. And, and so what we'll see is that this is the fulfillment of that, of that command from Jesus because Jerusalem heard the gospel at Pentecost and Judea heard the gospel as the church went out and celebrated the, the resurrection of Jesus together. And then Samaria heard because Philip went. And now we're going to see the gospel begin to go to the ends of the earth. 
You see, the good news isn't just for those in Jerusalem. It's for all Judea. The good news isn't just for the Jews. It's for the Jewish light Samaritans. The good news isn't just for the Samaritans. It's for all people, including this eunuch from Ethiopia. Why? Because the gospel is for everyone. Everywhere. Every time. But the gospel doesn't just come out of the blue. I don't know about you guys, for the people in here who know Jesus, but the gospel didn't come to you because a window in heaven opened and Jesus popped up out of it and said, hey, it's me, I'm real, believe in me. No, the people in this room became Christians because someone else introduced you to Jesus. Whether it was a parent or a grandparent, a family member, whether it was a friend, whether it was a youth minister or pastor, whether it was someone who brought you to church. You were introduced to the gospel because someone influenced you, because someone spoke the good news to you. You see, God's people are sent to share the gospel. Philip is chosen. He's sent by an angel to this specific spot for this specific time to talk to this specific person. And so are you. You do not have the job that you have because you applied for it, because you interviewed well, because you worked hard, because you were promoted into it, or because someone you knew gave you the job. You have the job that you have now, really, because the God of the universe ordained that you would be in the position that you're in so that you could share the gospel with the people that you work with, the customers that you help, and the people you interact with every day. That your family is not an accident. You didn't accidentally meet your spouse. Your kids are not randomly assembled bits of DNA and genes. No, your family was molded, chosen, and created by God before the foundations of the earth so that you could share the gospel with them. You are not in Clarksville by accident. Gateway Christian Church doesn't stand at 781 Windermere Drive by accident. No, we are right here in this community because we are chosen by God to share the gospel, just like Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. You are chosen to share the gospel, but you are also crucial, crucial to explaining the gospel. It says this, Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. You have to know to be able to teach. I remember a time in high school where there was a bug going around. It might have been the swine flu, but I can't remember. There was a bug going around the student body, and then the teachers started catching it. It started going around the teacher's lounge. And so teachers would be out periodically. And one day, my AP calculus teacher was out. Now, I don't know if you've ever taken AP calculus. If you haven't, uh, good on you. Good on you, especially if you're not a rocket scientist. You didn't need it. Um, but if you did take AP Calculus and you put yourself through that, let me tell you, it ain't easy. And, and so we get in this room and we have a substitute teacher. And um, I can pretty much guarantee you she doesn't know calculus. Um, she was um, what we call eccentric. Um, she would uh, sing all the time. No, no, no. All the time. Like, y- y- she took requests all class. She could be in the middle of teaching, and we could be like, hey, sing this song. And she's like, well, I don't know it. And she's like, I'll pull up the lyrics on my phone, and she'll try and sing it. She'll take a stapler and sing into it like a microphone. She was eccentric. And, and, and we knew that, and we weren't about to, like, let this opportunity pass. And, and, and I think that she was comfortable with it because um, she didn't know calculus. And so we didn't get any of the teacher's notes done that day, and she just sang the whole time into a stapler. Why? Because, well, we were high school students and we were dumb, but also because you have to know to be able to teach. And the sovereign God of the universe has given us the responsibility and privilege to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. We, church, not me, 
not pastors, not elders, we, we, you included, are crucial to explaining the gospel. Because the gospel is for everyone, everywhere, every time. Here's the question. Do we even know it? If I asked you after church, if I approached you and asked, what is the gospel? Could you tell me? One of the most heartbreaking moments I've ever had in youth ministry was a year and a half ago where I sat in that conference room with a small group of high school aged boys and asked them what the gospel is and not one of them could tell me. One of them picked up the Bible and just kind of pointed at it. They could not articulate what the gospel is. The simple gospel of Jesus Christ. And it was heartbreaking for me because I am not the one who was supposed to introduce them to it. Church, if I can be real, you are. The one who was supposed to introduce their kids to the gospel is their parents. Like I said earlier, your family was chosen by God so that you could share the gospel with them. And I was heartbroken because these high school age boys could not articulate what the gospel is. And my question is, are we sitting with them as they go to bed and reading the scriptures? Have we recaptured the dinner table so that we can sit down and discuss with them the things of God? Are we talking with our kids about the gospel because these are our kids? And my fear is that our kids don't know it because we don't know it. And we don't know it because we fail to search it out, to understand it. Since then, I've made them memorize the definition of the gospel. And this isn't like the end-all, be-all of what the gospel is, but like I, if they're going to know something, they're going to know this definition, and it's this. The gospel is the good news that Jesus came, died, and rose again to save us from death, sin, and hell. But the heartbreaking part for me is that I shouldn't have been the one to introduce them to that. Like, that's basic. That's what gets you in. Like, you have to believe that good news that Jesus saves. And I think many of them did believe that, but here's the hard part. I don't think any of them equated the good news that Jesus saves with the gospel. In other words, they knew that Jesus saves, but they didn't know in their bones, in their guts, that the message that Jesus saves needs to be shouted from the rooftops, or more accurately, shared over a lunch table and in study hall. Why doesn't our church grow exponentially? Like, why isn't there a resurging movement of Christianity in Clarksville? Here's why. It's simple. Because we are not sharing the gospel. And my fear is that we are not sharing because we do not know. Again, if I asked you after church if you could tell me what the gospel is, could you? If you came across like Philip, someone reading Isaiah 53, could you explain it to them? Could you tell them what it really means? Because you are crucial to explaining the gospel. But before you are able to explain the gospel, three, you are called to believe the gospel. This eunuch hears this teaching from Philip and he's cut to the heart. Why? Well, it says that he began with that very passage of scripture. And that's important. Like, what was he reading? It says this, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Now this may seem like a little different from the passage that I quoted earlier. Here's the thing, he's using what we call the Septuagint. It's the Greek Old Testament. And what we have in our Bibles today is a translation from the Hebrew Old Testament. And there's a few translation differences, but I think that that's important because it leads us to something interesting here. Two things are spoken about in the passage, the way the eunuch quotes it. Number one, he's quoting the part that's about the humiliation of Jesus. But number two, it's written in such a way that the suffering servant Jesus, because he is crucified and killed, has no descendants because the opportunity is robbed of, from him. This is perfect for the eunuch, where he knew that God understood his, his pain of never able to be, never able to be a father. And maybe he was, uh, here's the thing. Here's the thing. This passage that the, the eunuch is reading was written on a scroll. Like, he didn't have a bound Bible like we have. 
And so he, he probably had like what we would have today as several chapters of Isaiah is this kind of later part of the book of Isaiah where he's reading, of course, Isaiah 52 and 53 like we read earlier, but he probably was able to read more. Like maybe he was reading Isaiah 55, 5 where it says, surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you, because the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. And maybe he's struck because like, he's included. I mean, maybe he's just reading Isaiah 53, 12, 12, which is right there, where it says that he bore the sins of many, and he explains how Jesus is the substitution in our place and takes our punishment upon himself so that we don't have to suffer it and we can spend an eternity with God. Or maybe he was touched by Isaiah 54, 1 which says, sing, barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song and shout for joy, you who are never in labor, because you more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Uh, I don't know what he was struck by, but something struck him. Something struck him, and he knew that he had to respond. Now, I don't know where Philip took him in Isaiah, but this is good news for him. Like Deep down, he knew that God loved him and had saved him, so he responded. Because a man that had always been on the outside, whether it, came to, whether it came to being a parent, whether it came to being included in society, and whether it came to being included in this religion, a man who was always on the outside was finally accepted. And he finally realized that the gospel is for everyone, everywhere, every time. It says this, As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the, and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Before I was at Gateway, I was a part-time youth minister in Nevada, Missouri. Uh, it's spelled just like Nevada, but they insist, like a bunch of these Missouri and like Oklahoma towns, that the way it's pronounced is Nevada. Uh, there's a town in Oklahoma called Miami. It's spelled just like Miami. I don't know what they're doing. I don't, they might be trying to start their own country over there, but this is Nevada, Missouri. And so my first summer there, I took uh, a group to CIY, and we took a grand total, a big old group of two students. And I took two sponsors with me who were the parents of one of the students because that, pa- that student didn't want to come unless her parents were there. And uh, let me tell you, um, it, was a, it was a real treat. Um, but that whole week, they got to hear the gospel uh, in a way that they hadn't heard before. And if you're familiar at all with CIY, the second to last day of CIY move, you get what they call extended erect time, where they want you to take the group out into the community and have fun and experience the community that you're in. Like, for instance, our, uh, our church um, a couple years ago went to uh, Cleveland, Tennessee, and we went whitewater rafting. And I won't tell that story from stage. Uh, I see Tracy Blake back there nodding his head uh, because he knows what happened. And uh, if you want to know, I'll tell you, but not up here. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so we went to extended rec time in Joplin, Missouri. Now, only a couple of you in the room know Joplin, Missouri, but you know, there ain't much to do around there. Um, there's a creek, I think. Um, but there's really not much to do. So we went to the mall and walked around for a while, and then we ended up at Cheddar's eating lunch. And as we're sitting there eating lunch, they're like, hey, Ben, can we ask you some questions? Like, we've been hearing this week all about, like, the gospel, and we've been hearing about freedom, and we've been hearing about what Jesus did for us. And this isn't making sense, because I'm constantly worried that I'm going to, like, be thrown out of the faith, that I'm not, like, in. I'm like, what do you mean? And they're like, well, I listen to this kind of music. Like, is it Okay. Or, or, hey, I, I watched like, this type of movie one time and I was worried that like, I can't be a Christian anymore. Or, or I did this, this, and this. I did X, Y, and Z and I'm worried that I'm out and I'm worried that I'm not saved. And I looked at him and I was like, no, you cannot earn your salvation. Like, it is the gospel that saves you. Like, if you are in Christ, you cannot earn your salvation. If you have been baptized into Christ, if you have repented of your sin, if you have acknowledged him as Lord and you are his, and the only way you can, then the only way that you can lose him is if you say, I'm done, and you walk away. I don't believe in once saved, always saved. I do believe in once saved. It's pretty hard to get unsaved. And if you are saved, you are good with God. I mean, they were shocked. Like, we didn't hear this at our last church. We were constantly, like, trying to pray for forgiveness and worried that God had been mad at us. And, and we're going to need some time to think about this. But in the coming weeks, it was, it was awesome to see this weight lifted off these four people's shoulders. Like, they were finally free. This eunuch realized that the rejection that he had been feeling for years was gone. 
This eunuch, as he encounters Philip, realizes his rejection is no more. The rejection from a society that ridiculed him. The rejection from a faith that had made him fatherless. The rejection from a God who would never let this eunuch into his religion. That all that rejection faded away before the cross of Jesus the Messiah. You are called to believe the gospel. Just as he was called to believe the gospel. Because the gospel is for everyone, everywhere, every time. And some of you have been following Jesus for years and decades, and you've never really let yourself believe this. You have been plagued by spiritual anxiety, where you're worried that your prayers are not being answered because you're not praying the right way. Where you're worried that you're not reading the Bible right, the right way, and you're worried you're getting it wrong, and you're worried it's not going to work. Or you're worried that I, 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 did, I did the parenting thing wrong, and my, and, and, or you're worried that, that uh, I haven't been going to church exactly the right way, or I haven't been giving enough, or I haven't been doing this, and you have this anxiety constantly about your faith, and you're constantly asking questions about if you and God are good, and if you're doing this Christianity thing the right way, and you have spiritual anxiety. Let me tell you this right now. The gospel says that you are free. The gospel says that God loves you, and even more than that, because you are his and because the blood of Jesus covers you, that God likes you. It's not that God's like, oh, I guess we'll take him in. No, he loves you dearly and wants you deeply. And he does not have you on the outside. The gospel says that you are free. This eunuch who wanted to go into the temple to worship God, but never could because this religion kept him at an arm's length, he is welcomed in now. And you, Christian, who are constantly facing this anxiety, feeling like God and His church are keeping you at an arm's length, thinking that because of your actions, the way that you pray, the way that you do things, because of whatever it is that is causing you to have spiritual anxiety, that you are kept at an arm's length from God, need to know that you have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And that you are free. But some of you have never believed this. Like, there are probably some people in this room who have gone to church for 10 plus years and have never responded to the gospel. There might be somebody in this room who just walked in for the first time and they do not know Jesus. I don't know what your situation is. But man, if you have been living in shame, guilt, and you have been overburdened by everything going on within your soul, and you don't think that you're in, man, let me tell you, if you have been, believed in Jesus, been baptized, and you have not walked away, you're in. But if you haven't, it's time. It's time to become a Christian. It's time to be free. And after I'm done preaching, after I pray, I will be over here at this door. Please come pray with me and let's talk. If you're going through spiritual anxiety and you need to be free, come, please, let's pray and let's talk. If you've got something going on in your life and you just need prayer, please come pray with me. Man, be free. Be free. Because the gospel is for everyone. Everywhere. Every time. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the gospel. God, I pray that we would be rooted in it. And I pray that we would throw out all notions of effort and performance to earn our salvation, but that we would know that we have been saved by you. And God, while this seems contradictory, God, that our salvation in you drives us in love and appreciation to lay down our lives for others. God, I pray that we would see that. I pray that we would see that the gospel has freed us and our love and appreciation for the freedom that you have given us would drive us to share the gospel with those around us in our workplaces, in our families, and in our communities. God, I pray that we would not leave this room not prepared to share the gospel. God, I pray that we would go out this week and tell someone about Jesus because the gospel is for everyone, everywhere, every time. Thank you for the gospel. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, who was crucified, who rose again to save us from death, sin, and hell. Amen.